Have you ever experienced going blind in one eye? In the spring of 2006, while on my way to perform robotic surgery, I experienced what can best be described as a curtain coming down over my left visual field. In a matter of a very few moments, I had lost all vision in my left eye. Earlier that week, I crashed while skiing in Maribel and bruised the left side of my face, which appeared to resolve at least externally. Unfortunate for me, I developed a giant retinal tear, though thankfully this was amenable to surgical repair. But this experience helped me empathize with patients suffering retinal diseases, the most common in the developed world being age-related macular degeneration, where vision loss is a dreaded outcome. That is, until 2014, when, in Japan, a 70-year-old woman with near blindness underwent a groundbreaking procedure using stem cells. In what was an extraordinary world's first, Japanese researchers took her skin, and in the lab, reprogrammed her skin cells into youthful stem cells, then grew a sheet of retinal pigment epithelium cells, the specialized cells that line the back of the eye. This was then implanted into her eye in a procedure which has provided hope for millions of visually impaired patients worldwide. Today, there are at least 4,000 scientists engaged in stem cell research globally. The hope is that their discoveries and inventions will provide patients, especially the older population, with a vastly improved quality of life through the repair and replacement of their diseased and damaged organs. I first became involved in organ replacement as a postgraduate student in transplant immunology at Cambridge. Over three years, I spent the days in the research lab performing heart grafts between different strains of rats and across species to study the potential of new immunosuppressive drugs in overcoming organ rejection. In the evenings, through the nights, and on weekends, I learned the art of liver transplants from pioneer surgeon Saroy Khan. A large part of this training involved flying in small aircraft to hospitals within the UK and Europe to retrieve organs from mainly road trauma victims. At 35, I returned home and successfully performed Singapore's first liver transplant and became godmother to my patient's son six years later. My patient remains alive and well today, a quarter century later, and is among Asia's longest surviving recipients of a cadaveric donor liver. This initial success encouraged the development of a multi-organ transplant program in a country with a population of just 3 million at the time. So a program to harvest organs from executed prisoners was launched. Till today, I still vividly recall walking through the high security prison on Friday mornings at 5 a.m. Though I always kept my gaze straight, I could feel the haunting stares of the 18 to 20 prisoners on death row follow my every footstep as I made my way to the makeshift operating room. There, in the stillness of the pre-dawn, my team and I would await the arrival of the prisoner, a blue hood covering his head, fresh from his execution. I remained on the prison's organ retrieval team for several years and through a pregnancy. What kept me going was to focus my thoughts on the recipients whose lives would be saved by this procedure. While my patients knew the source of their donor organs, it was never once brought up as a topic for discussion or deliberation. Put yourselves in their shoes for a moment. Would you refuse an organ from an executed prisoner if it could save your life? 
During those early years of my surgical career, the lab was my sanctuary. It was where I could take refuge from the uncomfortable realism that as a doctor, in order to save lives, I had first to take parts of life from the deceased, whether victims of accident or execution. In the lab, I was able to process these thoughts and think up solutions to the issues in transplantation which troubled me. Around that time, transplant surgeons were exploring the use of animal organs as xenographs. At Cambridge, and subsequently in my lab in Singapore, we actively investigated the use of pigs as organ donors, but faced what seemed an unsurmountable immunologic challenge such that this cross-species research lost momentum. Then, in 2013, the discovery by Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley and others of the genome editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 sparked a renewed interest and enthusiasm in xenographs. Through the deletion of certain porcine genes and the insertions of some human genes, it seemed possible to significantly dampen the human immune response to pig organs. The potential impact of this scientific breakthrough was perhaps best captured in the title of Nature Biotechnology's 2016 review article, Xenotransplantation Makes a Comeback. Further progress in genome editing may one day lead to clones of genetically engineered pigs bred to provide a limitless supply of donor organs. Alongside the xenograph research, there has been a rapidly growing interest, hype, and hope in stem cell research. Stem cells, as undifferentiated, immature cells, have the potential to multiply to large numbers and differentiate into a variety of different tissues, heart, liver, kidney cells, neurons, bone cartilage, and insulin-secreting cells. Human stem cells seem the ideal building blocks for organ replacement. What if patients no longer needed to depend on donor organs to save their lives? What if patients could now use a few cells from an embryo, a fellow human being. Best of all, cells derived from their own bodies to create new tissues and organs. Of the three main types of stem cells, embryonic stem cells, controversial to some, are pluripotent and can be differentiated into any cell type in the body. Adult stem cells, on the other hand, while non-controversial as they are derived from our bone marrow, blood, and fat, yet lack the true pluripotent potential of embryonic stem cells and are limited in their ability to differentiate into all cell types in the body. Then, in 2012, the stem cell field gained further momentum and heightened visibility when John Gurdon and Shinya Yamanaka were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells. This discovery has made it possible to turn back the clock, to take mature adult cells as in a skin biopsy and in the lab, reprogram these old cells into youthful cells termed iPS cells. These iPS cells derived from self are pluripotent like embryonic stem cells, but without the ethical concerns, and can be differentiated into any cell type in the body. So, with the promise of stem cells as building blocks to create tissues, the next step was to design and manufacture scaffolds in order to build three-dimensional organs. There has been tremendous innovation in the fields of material science and tissue engineering in creating different types of scaffolds biologic, synthetic, as well as the new dynamic nanoelectric scaffolds. With 3D printing technology coupled with the use of cells as a form of bio-ink, it has been possible to print the simple flat structures like skin 
and the hollow tubular structures like blood vessels and upper airway tubes. But what about the more complex organs like the heart or the liver, which comprise so many more cells with an extensive vascular architecture? Well, what's been possible so far, for example, is to print not a whole liver, but tiny sheets of liver tissue for drug toxicity testing and as patches to potentially graft onto damaged livers. The new dynamic nanoelectronic scaffolds, when seeded with cells such as cardiomyocytes, may one day enable us to grow the next generation transplantable hearts capable of monitoring their own electrical activity. So where are we now? In strictly clinical trials, adult stem cells have been implanted in patients with heart failure and post-myocardial infarction. It is still unclear whether these stem cells add value by delivering growth factors to help in the recovery of the damaged heart muscle, or whether they actually differentiate into heart muscle cells. It is also unclear whether these cells even remain in the treated areas and become integrated, or migrate and get washed out of the heart. Future directions in organ repair and replacement await the outcome of these and other clinical trials. It is truly an exciting time to be in stem cell research, particularly as some of this transitions to the clinic. Looking back, I would never have imagined that the child I was carrying while harvesting donor organs in the prisons would grow up to be a student researcher working with cardiomyocytes in a stem cell lab. Alongside advances in bioengineering organs. Conventional procedures to transplant these organs has been disrupted by robotic surgery, first introduced in the late 1990s. Robotic surgical systems provide the surgeon with a three-dimensional, 10 times magnified view of the human body, seven degrees of freedom of movement of fine wristed instruments, motion scaling, and filtration of tremor. These robotic instruments enter the human body through multiple small sub-centimeter incisions and enable complex procedures to be performed with unparalleled precision. Surgical theaters of the future will be equipped with advanced imaging devices, robotic technology, and augmented reality. Like a pilot in a cockpit, the surgeon seated at a console will have not just a three-dimensional magnified view, but real-time access to patient data and the ability to superimpose patient CT scans and MRIs onto the operative field. As of now, the surgeon is in full control of the robot's movements. With artificial intelligence, it will soon be possible to automate and add precision to some of the repetitive surgical tasks such as suturing within the deep confines of the body. Today, it is a diversified team of experts, not just surgeons, but computer scientists and engineers whose collective innovations continue to push the envelope and revolutionize the field of organ transplants. Just as it was a surgeon who won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in stem cells, so it may be a computer scientist, an engineer, even an autonomous robot who remotely performs the next revolutionary organ replacement surgery. It is a brave new world where new and disruptive technologies provide us with increasingly bold choices to engineer ourselves. In the quest for longevity, allowing ourselves to print our own organs, be bioengineered using non-human spare parts, technologically enhanced using computerized implants, and eventually transitioning to cyborgs 
or human-machine hybrids will one day become reality. Thank you. <laughs>